Throughout the 1930s, the United States suffered the longest and deepest economic depression in its history. Many people point to the stock market crash of October 1929 as the cause of the depression. But there was not one single cause of the Great Depression. Instead, it was a combination of several weaknesses in the economy of the 1920s that created a chain reaction and vicious economic cycle. It is more accurate to say that the crash triggered the depression. One economic factor that contributed was the large income gap in the 1920s. Completely accurate statistics are difficult to develop, but the trend was pretty apparent. By the late 20s, the top 5% of the American population controlled approximately one-third of the nation's wealth. To illustrate this, consider the following example. Imagine we had a population of 100 people and a total wealth of $1,000. If the top 5% controlled one-third of that wealth, five people would split $333, which works out to about $67 each. 95 people would then split the remaining $667, which works out to $7 each. The reason that this income distribution is problematic is because the top 5% of the population cannot spend enough money to support the entire economy. Think about this scenario. If you owned a car dealership, would you rather sell five people 10 cars each because they are super rich, or would you rather sell 95 people one car each? Some economists believe that a wealthy class can spend enough money to create jobs for everybody else. This is known as trickle-down economics. The problem, though, was that the money was not trickling down. Another problem with the economy was a massive deregulation effort by the federal government. You may recall that the previous 30 years during the Progressive Era in World War I, there was much more government regulation of business. Teddy Roosevelt, Taft, Woodrow Wilson, all had a reputation for breaking up trusts and monopolies. When Warren Harding was elected president in 1920, he promised to reverse this trend of government regulation. He promised what he called a return to normalcy. Warren Harding died in 1923, but his successor Calvin Coolidge continued this deregulation trend, stating that the business of America was business. Now free from government regulation, many corporations began a frenzy of mergers and acquisitions. This did lead to short-term growth, but it was also problematic. Here is another scenario to help you understand why this trend is risky. Imagine there are three companies. We'll call them Company A, Company B, and Company C. And they each employ 100 people. If Company A goes out of business, 100 people will lose their job. And there is a chance that the other companies can pick up some of the slack. In other words, the damage of one company's collapse is somewhat limited. What was happening in the 1920s, though, was that Company A would buy up the other companies and form a much larger company we'll call Company D. Now Company D employs 300 people. If Company D collapses, now 300 people would lose their jobs. The damage is much more widespread, and the merger itself puts Company D at risk because they have to invest their profits to pay for the merger rather than invest it back into the company itself. Another problem with the 1920s economy was that goods were overproduced. During the 1920s, demand was high because many people were buying products on credit, which led to a large amount of consumer debt. To meet the demand, companies produced more and more. Once consumers began to cut back on spending, however, demand dried up. Now companies had a surplus of goods, which led them to cut back on their production, and that leads to layoffs. During the 1920s, the stock market was booming and it was not regulated, which led to some risky and unethical behavior. Many people bought stocks on margin. If you bought stocks on margin, that meant that you took a loan from a stockbroker to pay for the stock and paid the loan off when the value of the stock increased. This works well as long as the stock value continues to increase. As a result of this great interest in the stock market, many stocks were overinflated. In other words, they were not worth as much as people were paying for them a stock market bubble was beginning to form. Sensing that the bubble was about to burst in October of 1929, many people began to sell their stock at the same time. This is called panic selling, and this is what led to the crash. Finally, there was the nation's banking system. Banks were not regulated very well, and people's money was not insured. In other words, if you put your money in a bank, you were taking quite a big risk. Throughout the 1920s, banks offered generous loans to stockbrokers and invested shareholder money in the stock market. When the crash happened, they simply lost the money and they began to close. If you had money in the bank, it was gone. All of these factors were tied together, and each one made the other worse. The economy of the nation went into a rapid downward spiral, which lasted throughout the next decade.